many like you, many of you here may be like me, wondering why certain things exist in the world, like ants, setsi flies, mosquitoes, and maths, you know. But that is before you met somebody like Marcus Dusutoy, one of the foremost mathematicians in the world. Marcus doesn't just uh, play football and the trumpet, he makes maths come alive. He explains why maths is not just about numbers, but it's a language that helps you understand creation and the nature of the universe. Why footballers choose particular numbers for their jerseys, how you can predict weather, and perhaps even understand why hedge fund managers behave the way they do. Uh, Marcus has hosted many television series on maths and the importance of maths as a language. Uh, he's written two plays. He's written a book called Symmetry, which brings uh, home to us the aesthetics of nature that can be explained by maths. And barring Richard Dawkins, he is the only Simeone professor ever to hold that chair as the professor of public understanding of science. So today, to bring us and introduce us to the aesthetic of maths, please welcome Marcus Dusutoy. Of course, none of that would have been possible without the power of mathematics. <laughs> Intriguingly, a few years ago, when uh, David Beckham moved to Real Madrid, um, I was very intrigued by how much kind of interest and speculation there was about the choice of the number shirt that he was playing in, the number 23 shirt. Kind of in, it showed me how, how obsessed people are with different properties of number. Um, in fact, uh, one of the, your most famous Indian mathematicians, uh, Ramanujan, it was said of him that he used to know every number like his own personal friend. And many people in the media started speculating about Beckham's relationship with this number 23. Um, the most popular theory um, was the Michael Jordan theory, that um, in America they they don't know about football, they know about things like basketball and baseball, and so Real Madrid were hoping to sell a lot of football shirts in America by using Michael Jordan's um, shirt, he was the most famous basketball player, he used to play in the number 23 shirt. Um, so a lot of the British media certainly speculated, oh, all these Americans are going to go buy it, thinking it's a basketball shirt, not a football shirt. Real Madrid will become even richer than they already are. Um, others had a more sinister theory, saying actually Beckham shouldn't be putting 23 on his back. Because if you know your history, you might remember that Julius Caesar was in fact assassinated by being stabbed 23 times in the back. So others said a very bad idea to put 23 on his back. Now, being a math nerd, as soon as I saw this number, I said, oh, it's a really interesting number, because um, it's an example of a prime number. Now, a prime number, if you might remember from school, is a number which is only divisible by itself and one. And they're the most important numbers in my subject. In fact, about the same time as Beckham's move to Real Madrid, I'd just written a book all about my uh, prime numbers. They are my, my real personal obsession as a research mathematician. Um, this is the front cover of the book. Uh, my publisher let me choose my favorite primes to put on the cover of the book. So, of course, I live at a prime number house. So this is my house number, number 53. Um, I live in London, although I work in Oxford. My local bus that I take, I only take prime number buses, number 73. Um, 
And my local football team, we just stolen uh, um, a player from our rival team and put him in the 23 shirt. I'm an Arsenal supporter, um, so uh, I put an Arsenal 23 shirt on the front cover of the book. Now, of course, all the media saw this and said, oh, here's the man who ex can explain why Beckham chose the number 23 football shirt. So um, just as in India, we are also obsessed with sports um, and films and other things in England, um, we have a radio station which is just dedicated to sport, talk sport radio. Um, but they invited me onto their radio station to explain my theory about the 23 shirt. I think it must be the first time that higher mathematics has ever been talked on this radio station. So I regard that as a real coup. Anyway, on the way to the radio station, I had to start to come up with a theory for why I thought a footballer like Beckham might have chosen a prime number shirt. So I started to think about why primes are important to me as a mathematician. Well, the reason they're so important are they're literally the building blocks of my subject. If you take a number like 105, is that a prime number? No, it's clearly divisible by five. I can divide it by five, I get down to 21 times five. Is 21 prime? No, I can divide that into three times seven. So three, seven, and five. Now I've got down to numbers I can't divide any further. These are the primes, the indivisible numbers from which you build every other number. So 105 is built out of the primes three, five, and seven. And I like to call these prime numbers the atoms of arithmetic. For me, they are really the periodic table of mathematics. In chemistry, the most important thing that any chemist student learns is about the periodic table, atoms from which you bend all the mo molecules in the universe. Well, the primes for me are really the atoms, the hydrogen and oxygen of the world of mathematics. So I started to look at Real Madrid's football team. And it's clear that they've got a mathematician on the bench there at the time, because all the key players, all the building blocks of Real Madrid at the time, the Galacticos, they were all playing in prime number shirts. You had Carlos, building block of the defense was number three. Zidane, building block of the midfield, number five. Raul, number seven. Ronaldo, number 11. So Beckham comes along, he's a building block in their team, a Galacticos. So clearly this mathematician on the bench said, well, he deserves a prime number shirt, and so got the number 23 shirt. So this is my theory. Now, I can talk about prime number football shirts from a little bit of experience, because I also play for a football team um, in the east end of London. Uh, we're called Recreativo Hackney. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough players to have 23 shirts, so I couldn't have the 23 shirt. Uh, but I play in the number 17 shirt, um, a very nice prime, a prime called a Fermat prime. Um, now, we play in the Super Sunday League Division 2. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, our, uh, uh, we didn't do too well in our first uh, season in this league. If you look, we're right down there at the bottom. Um, uh, but, uh, but my prime number shirt did help me. If you look at the goals for, we scored 25 goals, and one of those is my goal, which I'm very proud of. Um, but unfortunately, if you look in the goals against us, we had 64 goals scored against us, and unfortunately, one of those is also my goal, which I'm <laughs> not so proud of. Um, anyway, uh, every season, Real Madrid get bigger and bigger, so they're going to need more and more of these prime numbers. So they come to me, the mathematician, and say, can we buy a formula off you for finding the next biggest prime number? And they'll be very surprised to learn that actually, mathematicians don't have some magic formula for finding these numbers. In fact, trying to understand where the next prime number is represents one of the biggest mysteries in our subject. I think many people have this impression that mathematics is somehow finished, that it's all kept in some wonderful textbook which is handed down to us, and they don't realize that mathematics is an evolving, changing subject with lots of things we still don't yet understand. When Fermat's last theorem got proved, I think that most people felt, well, that's the last theorem, we finished mathematics. Um, but actually, trying to understand these prime numbers is one of the mysteries of my subject. And I think it actually goes to the heart of what it means for me to be a mathematician. When I was at the party last night and people said, oh, what do you do? And I said, oh, well, I'm a mathematician. You could see the look of fear that descended on their faces. They would suddenly find that their glass had become very empty and they would drift off towards the bar. But I'm a very persistent person, so I would chase after them and say, no, no, we're a very misunderstood breed, mathematicians. <laughs> I do something very interesting. Um, 
I think that most people think that mathematics, that as a research mathematician, what I'm doing is sitting in my office doing very long division to a lot of decimal places. Well, a computer can do that. Perhaps I'm out of a job. But no, I'm a mathematician. I define a mathematician as a pattern searcher. Somebody who looks for logic and pattern in the chaotic world around us. And I think actually we'll find that that's a theme running through everybody who's going to talk here this, uh, over the next few days. That actually to think means to look for patterns and structure. And mathematics is perhaps the greatest subject for looking at the information that we've seen in the past, trying to distill where it's come from. But more importantly, spotting those patterns to be able to see where we're going to in the future. It's not just numbers, but the whole of the natural political world that depends on this mathematical mind in order to be able to actually navigate and make predictions about where we're going next. So in order to get you to start thinking, which is what you're here for, I've got a few patterns that I want to test on you to see how good you are at spotting patterns. So you've probably had these kind of uh, little tasks at school where you get given a sequence of numbers and you've got to spot the logic behind the numbers to be able to predict what's the next number in this sequence. Um, so if you've got a maths degree, you're not allowed to play on the first few, okay? But if you haven't got a maths degree, what's the next number in the sequence? 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. 36, oh, very fast there. Exactly, now you've got these numbers probably by adding one, plus two, plus three, plus four. These are the triangular numbers. Um, and you can view them very graphically. Um, they're the number of stones you need if you're making a triangle with an extra layer on each time. Now we understand these numbers very well. We have a formula which will help you to predict what the hundredth triangular number will be without having to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. That's somehow the power of mathematics and pattern searching is that it short circuits a lot of hard work. Actually, mathematicians are very lazy at heart. Um, OK, if you've read The Da Vinci Code uh, by Dan Brown, you're not allowed to play on this one. Um, but if you haven't read The Da Vinci Code, what's the next number in this sequence? 34. So you're clearly thinking very hard. Good pattern searches here. 34 is correct. If you didn't get why 34 is next, you add the two previous numbers together to get the next one in the sequence. So 21 plus 34 gives me 55, the next number. Now, these are a very famous sequence of numbers uh, called the Fibonacci numbers of the Italian mathematician, uh, 12th century, uh, 13th century mathematician Fibonacci, who realized that they appear all over the natural world. So if you're looking at the world of nature, you find Fibonacci numbers almost everywhere. Take a flower and count the number of petals in that flower, invariably it's a number in the Fibonacci sequence. And if it isn't a number in the Fibonacci sequence, that's because a petal has fallen off your flower, uh, which is how mathematicians get round exceptions. Um, <laughs> now, intriguingly, although these numbers are named after Fibonacci, they weren't the first, he wasn't the first to discover them. And in fact, they were discovered, first of all, here in India, not by mathematicians and scientists, by musicians and poets. They were actually looking at how many different rhythm structures that you can get with long and short beats, both in poetry and music. It was exciting to explore the different possibilities. So if you have um, long and short beats, and I have four beats in the bar, there are five different possibilities. I can do four short beats, or I can do short, short, long, or short, long, short, or long, short, short, or long, long. Five different possibilities. Now, if you have five beats in the bar, I can add a short beat to all of those, and so I'll have five more rhythms. But I could also take the ones with three beats in the bar and add a long beat to those. So by adding the two previous numbers together, we'll be able to tell that there are, in fact, eight different rhythms with long and short beats with five beats in the bar. And if I want to know eight beats in the bar, rather than working them all out, I can use this pattern to be able to predict how many rhythms there are. So in fact, these numbers should not be called the Fibonacci numbers. One of the uh, people to write about these numbers, uh, record their relationship to music, was actually Hamashandra. So in fact, they perhaps should be called the Hamashandra numbers rather than just the Fibonacci numbers. OK, you've done very well so far. What about the next sequence? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Well, actually, 31 is the next number in this sequence. I agree that 32 looks an obvious choice, but you have to take care in this game because patterns might be going one way and then can veer off in a completely unexpected direction. 
So let me tell you why 31 has an equal right to be the next number in this sequence as much as 32. You thought it was just doubling up. But actually, these are for circle division numbers. If I take a circle and put one point on the circle, then I just have one region, the circle in the middle. Now I'll put two points and join the points up. The circle is divided into two regions. Put another point, join all the points up. I have a triangle in the middle and three regions out the, around the outside. That's four regions that the circle's been divided up into. Now put another dot, four dots, join them all up. You get this little envelope in the middle, four regions there, four around the outside. You've got eight regions. You start to think you're spotting a pattern. So sure enough, when you add another dot, You've got five dots, you join those all up, you have this lovely five-pointed star with a pentagon around it, you count the number of regions here, you have 16 regions. Now you're sure you'll know what's going to happen next because you can see the numbers doubling each time, but if you predict that 32 is the next number of regions you'll get, you'll be wrong. In fact, you can try this later on your pieces of paper and with your pencils. If you put six dots around the circle, however you arrange them, you cannot get more than 31 regions. So there is a warning here, and it's an important warning. You might think a pattern is going one way, a very obvious pattern, but there could be unexpected surprises on the way. And in fact, that's the joy of doing mathematics, is the fact that things aren't always too obvious. Now, we have a formula for counting the number of regions. It's slightly more complicated than the other formulas. Uh, it's a, you take the number of points, raise it to the power of four, and do various other things, and you'll get the number of regions on this. So we can actually predict the number of regions that you'll get when you're dividing up the circle. OK, here's a slightly more challenging sequence. If you have a maths degree, you can play now. Um, 2, 9, 10, 11, 13, 16. Oh, a little bit quieter now. <laughs> You're also cocky over here, shouting out triangular numbers. Yes, Fibonacci, I know those. 20. It's close, but keep on working on that formula. Well, if you could get the 26 was the next number in that sequence, I recommend you buy a lottery ticket uh, this weekend because, in fact, these were the lottery ticket windings for the um, lottery in England on the 28th of September. <laughs> Another warning, not everything has patterns, okay? Choose your battles carefully. Now, of course, the next sequence, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, a formula for these numbers. If I did, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. I'd be on some tropical island enjoying myself, but... Um, now, of course, the next number of sequence is the sequence at the heart of my talk, the ones I am obsessed with, the prime numbers, which go from 19 to Beckham's number 23, then 29. But intriguingly, if you look at these numbers and you try to make some predictions about where they're going to go next, try and find a formula, it never seems to work. In fact, there seems to be more connection between these prime numbers and the lottery ticket numbers than between the primes, the Fibonacci, and triangular numbers. The primes seem to have some inherent sense of randomness and chaos in them, which is kind of frustrating for me as a mathematician. They're the building blocks of the whole of mathematics, yet our subject, the subject for the search for patterns, seems to be based on a sequence of numbers, which as you look them down, you can extend the sequence further, try and see if you can spot any patterns. But you'll find that any pattern you think is there suddenly just disappears in your hands as you try and count further and further. Now, intriguingly, the first people to discover the primes and to start to explore their properties were not humans at all, but in fact a curious little insect in the forests of North America. This insect, uh, it's a cicada. Now, you have cicadas here, but this is a very special cicada that you can only find in the forests in North America, which has this very curious lifestyle. It hides underground doing absolutely nothing for 17 years. Then after 17 years, the cicadas emerge from the ground en masse, almost on the same day, they fill the forest. This is the sound of one cicada. You have to multiply that, this by uh, several million of these things. Actually, the sound of the forest is so loud that residents generally move out of the area because it's so unbearable. And they party away, they eat the leaves, they mate, they lay eggs, and then after six weeks of partying, they all die. And the forest goes quiet again for another 17 years before the next brood arrives. That's absolutely amazing. There's nothing in the natural cycle which has a 17-year cycle to it. So how on earth these cicadas manage to count to 17 is already quite an amazing feat. But why are they choosing a prime number, 17, my favorite prime number, in order to be able to hide underground? 
OK, here's a slightly more challenging sequence. If you have a maths degree, you can play now. Um, 2, 9, 10, 11, 13, 16. No, oh, a little bit quieter now. <laughs> You're also cocky over here, shouting out triangular numbers. Yes, Fibonacci, I know those. 20. It's close, but keep on working on that formula. Well, if you could get the 26 was the next number in that sequence, I recommend you buy a lottery ticket uh, this weekend because, in fact, these were the lottery ticket windings for the um, lottery in the England on the 28th of September. <laughs> Another warning, not everything has patterns, okay? Choose your battles carefully. Now, of course, the next sequence, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, a formula for these numbers. If I did, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. I'd be on some tropical island enjoying myself, but... Um, now, of course, the next number of sequence is the sequence at the heart of my talk, the ones I am obsessed with, the prime numbers, which go from 19 to Beckham's number 23, then 29. But intriguingly, if you look at these numbers and you try to make some predictions about where they're going to go next, try and find a formula, it never seems to work. In fact, there seems to be more connection between these prime numbers and the lottery ticket numbers than between the primes, the Fibonacci, and triangular numbers. The primes seem to have some inherent sense of randomness and chaos in them, which is kind of frustrating for me as a mathematician. They're the building blocks of the whole of mathematics, yet our subject, the subject for the search for patterns, seems to be based on a sequence of numbers, which as you look them down, you can extend the sequence further, try and see if you can spot any patterns. But you'll find that any pattern you think is there suddenly just disappears in your hands as you try and count further and further. Now, intriguingly, the first people to discover the primes and to start to explore their properties were not humans at all, but in fact a curious little insect in the forests of North America. This insect, uh, it's a cicada. Now, you have cicadas here, but this is a very special cicada that you can only find in the forests in North America, which has this very curious lifestyle. It hides underground doing absolutely nothing for 17 years. Then after 17 years, the cicadas emerge from the ground en masse, almost on the same day, they fill the forest. This is the sound of one cicada. You have to multiply that, this by uh, several million of these things. Actually, the sound of the forest is so loud that residents generally move out of the area because it's so unbearable. And they party away, they eat the leaves, they mate, they lay eggs, and then after six weeks of partying, they all die. And the forest goes quiet again for another 17 years before the next brood arrives. That's absolutely amazing. There's nothing in the natural cycle which has a 17-year cycle to it. So how on earth these cicadas manage to count to 17 is already quite an amazing feat. But why are they choosing a prime number, 17, my favorite prime number, in order to be able to hide underground? Well, we're not too sure. But it seems to be something about the primeness, because there's another species in another area in North America which has a 13-year life cycle. You find 17, 13, but you never find 12, 14, 15, 16, 18, just these two prime numbers. So what is it about the primes which seems to be helping these cicadas? Well, we think, and it's only a theory, that there might have been a predator that also used to appear periodically in the forest and would try and time its arrival to coincide with the cicada. Now, the cicada, which had a prime number life cycle, could keep out of sync of the predator much better than those with a non-prime number life cycle. You can do a little experiment. Suppose the predator appears every six years. A cicada that appears every nine years, not a prime number, will meet it every 18 years. It'll get wiped out. But take a cicada that appears every seven years. Well, six and seven don't meet until year 42. So the primeness, although it's appearing more often in the forest, actually enables the cicada to survive much better. So perhaps the reason Beckham chose 23 is that primes are the key to survival in the natural world. Now, although the cicadas have been evolu using evolutionary tactics to understand the primes, it's the mathematical mind, the analytical mind, which is the one which really started to get to, to grips with these numbers. And perhaps Euclid um, represents the beginning of mathematics as a subject of proof, proving things with 100% certainty. That is something that mathematics can do, which I think no other subject can. 
Science is more a process of evolution. It's the survival of the fittest theory. But mathematics is the only subject, I think, where we're still teaching the discoveries of the ancient Greeks to our kids today. The discoveries the ancient Greeks made are as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. And that's the power of mathematics, that you can prove things with 100% certainty. And so Euclid proved in one of his books that the primes, they go on forever. You could never write down a table of primes. The chemists have a periodic table of chemical elements, which lists all the elements from which you can create atoms. It's a finite table. It has something like 120 atoms, some of them unstable or towards the end. But if we tried to write down the primes in a big table, a periodic table, we would be writing forever, because Euclid proved that these primes go on forever. So we have a much more difficult chart task than the, the chemist who can just list their primes. Now, intriguingly, this is the largest prime number we've so far discovered. It's uh, 2 to the power 43 million, which is very, and, uh, 112,609, and then you take one off that number. Now, this is a very large prime number. It has 13 million digits. If I read it out loud to you now, I would have that woman ringing her bell very loudly at me because it would take me two months. Um, but actually, it's intriguing that although this is the biggest we've so far discovered, we know that there are infinitely many more beyond that. But it's somehow a mark of the fact that we do not understand these numbers well enough that this is the biggest one we can so far find. In fact, there's somebody who broke the uh, 10 million digit mark actually won a prize of $100,000 for finding that. And anyone who breaks the next uh, um, sort of milestone, which is 100 uh, um, million digits, there's another prize out there for them. But actually, the biggest prize is trying to understand a pattern inside these prime numbers. For that, there is, in fact, a million dollar prize from the Clay Institute in America because it is so important. Now, it's important to me as a mathematician because these are building blocks of my subject. But why should it be important for society as a whole? Well, actually, we are putting the whole of our security on online. Every time we send our credit card, we are using properties of prime numbers to keep that credit card safe and protected. The codes that are used to protect the digital world all depend on these prime numbers. I said that if you take a number like 105, you could break that down into its primes, and you did that very easily into 3 times 5 times 7. Actually, what you did there without knowing it was crack an internet code. Because the codes that are being used on the internet take a big number, slightly bigger than 105. This number here, for example, is not a prime number. It's a bit like salt. It's made out of a sodium and a chlorine. But what is the two atoms that built these two numbers? If you can crack this, you will crack the codes that are being used on the internet. So this number here is two prime numbers multiplied together. The person who built this hasn't told anybody yet what those two primes are. And there's another prize if you can find the two primes which divide this number here. And if you can do that, you will get access, and you can do it for any number. You'll be able to crack every code that's being used on the internet today. Now, I decided my football team was doing so badly in their first season that I would take a little bit of um, a hint from Beckham's move to Real Madrid choosing this 23. And so the next season, I decided if we're going to do something about getting off the bottom of the league, we'd better do something. So I persuaded my team to change their kit. I told you I played in the number 17 shirt, so here's our new kit. Um, so here's my 17 shirt, which I borrowed uh, for this weekend. Um, I persuaded every member of my team to play in a prime number now. So we play two, three, four, no, five, seven. So here, here we are coming out to play. Let me show you. Um, uh, oops. Let's, uh. So we go all the way up to 43. Primes all the way up to 43. And it's extraordinary. It transformed our season. Using these prime number shirts, we came second in the league. We got promoted to the Super Sunday League Division One, where unfortunately, we learned very quickly that these prime numbers, they only last for one season, because we've been relegated back down again to the bottom division. Um, and I'm currently working on a new theory, which is uh, this T-shirt. So I've given every member of my team a T-shirt with a quadratic equation that everyone has to solve if they're trying to work out where the ball is going to land to be able to bang it in the back of the net. In fact, involves solving this quadratic equation. So thank you very much.